I just wanted to remind you, you know, to keep your voice up for videotaping and everything and not to use the names of any minors or victims. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And you have your full 15 minutes. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. Um, well, as, as you know from the brief, it's a one-issue case here. Uh, started with the state filing a motion to show cause, alleging that my client, or the appellant, um, violated one of the conditions of this suspended sentence by mailing some letters that were ordered as part of the sentence that he not disseminate. Uh, the issue became, when were these letters mailed? Uh, and there was essentially a three-hour window from the point where my, the appellant, my client, left the O'Leary Municipal Court just before 5 p.m. and presented himself at the Lorain County Jail just before 8 p.m. because he was ordered to report to jail because he was given a 15-day jail sentence that afternoon. Um, so the state alleged that he mailed these letters in violation of this condition of this suspended sentence in that three-hour window. The state presented no evidence whatsoever to support that uh, allegation. Uh, they presented one witness, and that was the recipient of the letter, who received the letter some three days later, uh, the, had the envelope that was postmarked on the 20th of December, which was the day following the uh, alleged mailing. Uh, and then the state presented no, no other evidence, no witnesses, nobody from the post office, no video from the post office, no other evidence whatsoever that, that my client mailed those letters in that three-hour window. I have a record, a record question, and that is, they keep referring to this, our story, in the briefs, but nobody says what our story is, and I'll, I'll, I'll find that out looking at the record, but, so what is this, our story, our, why is it prohibited? Well, and be careful with my admonition about what you can and can't say. No, it's okay. <laughs> Little the backstory, and there's a little bit of a backstory. Our story was a three-page letter okay. that my client wrote. Uh, the, the victim of the menacing by stalking charge, the, the, the substance of this whole case, was his ex-wife. They'd been married twenty some years. They had been divorced about one year prior to this case, and they had adult children. In any event, the, my story was my client had written. A letter to his ex-wife just talking about their time together and the disturbing part to Judge White was it also can discuss their lifestyle and their lifestyle was while married and this wasn't contested this was their lifestyle uh, they were swingers they engaged with other couples who were swingers they engaged in threesomes during their marriage, and this wasn't really in dispute, but... So, so he was saying, don't distribute details about your he, uh, he sexual... Had, what had happened, uh, which the basis of this menacing by stalking, his ex-wife had a new boyfriend, my client put together this three-page story just to let the new boyfriend know this is what our experience was, and he gave that letter to her new boyfriend, hence, part and parcel of the menacing by stalking that he originally was charged with. So that was the offensive part of it. So when he was agreed to plead on the 19th, we were there that afternoon for a, a pretrial. And, and I think it's worth noting that pretrial was set a few days a week of file, about a week before that, the state had filed a motion to revoke my client's bond. Uh, making some allegations. So when we went to court that afternoon, I advised my client, the state filed this motion to revoke your bond, we may have, we're gonna have to address this at this pretrial. And, and so that's why he mailed the letters on his way to court, which, which is the second part of my brief, which the, the record establishes, I submit. But in any event, he had sent those letters, the copy of the letters, the My Story, it's a three-page letter, to his adult daughter because her mother, his ex, there was some estrangement going on, and he wanted his daughter to hear the story. Anyway, that's why he mailed the letters at 1.30 that day, and anticipating that that day he may be going to jail. Well, so, now, they, they were postmarked the next day. They were postmarked the 20th, So, but they were mailed, according to my client's sworn testimony and the Google Maps that we presented, they were mailed on the 19th at 
approximately 1.30 p.m. on its way to the courthouse. His, his pretrial was scheduled the 19th at, I think, 2 p.m., and he arrived at 1.35, according to his testimony in the Google Maps, at the courthouse. And the Google Maps, though, just showed that he was in that location. It showed the route from the funeral home on Cleveland Street to the courthouse, and it's only about a mile. As you, if you know Elyria, it's, the funeral home is on Cleveland Street in Elyria. You go down Cleveland Street to Bridge Street, Bridge hooks into Broad Street, which is where the Elyria Municipal Court is. On Bridge Street is the post office, and the map, it, the Google Maps actually showed his route in the map. It shows him go into the turnaround where the post office is, and then proceeded and parked right in front of the Elyria Municipal Court. There's also timing, timelines, it states at 1.25 he left the, the funeral home, at 1.30, somewhere around there he's by the post office, and at 1.32, I believe, if the numbers, my memory's right, he's parking in front of the Leary Municipal Court. And, and the, Leary, the post office in Leary has a drive-through drop box, and that's where he... There was testimony regarding what he did after the court hearing. Was there a Google map that showed where he went after the court hearing? There was not. Were there, court, go ahead. Were there pretrial, just were there pretrial orders that he wasn't supposed to be disseminating this? No. Pre, prior to the sentencing. Prior to sentencing. No, there was a there was a, was there a, a no basic con? no contact no order. No contact order. Right. Okay. Right. Con and no that con. may have been part of the problem, part of the issue with the motion to revoke bond and the stated file that hadn't been heard. The no contact order went just to the ex-wife, I take it, and not the correct. Trial. Correct. The boyfriend was not a named victim or just a... The court seemed to have some concern from what I can gather about the fact that even assuming what you say is correct, and he mailed this before the hearing, he didn't speak up and say, hey, wait a minute, I want everyone to know I've already mailed something. And right. now the order says don't do this, but the door has been opened already, I apologize, and, you know, what can I do about that? The court seemed to view that as you know, almost a credibility question for him. And they didn't say yeah, that, about that's it, that's correctly noted in the record, and that did seem to bother or disturb. I think was his word that the, the, the Judge White, the trial judge. It, it's also worth noting, though, Judge White was absent on the nineteenth. There was visiting Judge Lockgraves, who was filling in for him, and she she was kind of insistent that he go to jail that day. It, it kind of happened as is, you know, you go to pretrials and. There's some negotiations, and there's this pending motion to revoke your bond, and the state wanted some jail time. The victim was there wanting some jail time, and Judge Lockgraves was made it pretty clear, uh, we're getting this case resolved today, and you're going to jail today. So then the order gets put on it, you know, as part of the sentencing order, or the conditions, I should say, of the sentencing order gets put on. Did he mention it that day, at that moment, to Judge Lockgraves? No, I doubt it even came into his mind that it was an issue at that point. And, but I guess the point I would, I would like the court to, to consider, I mean, I understand Judge White had an issue with that. You know, why didn't you speak up and then you had this court order? Um, that's not a violation. The fact that he mailed, when he mailed them was not prohibited. Was there a protection order? As far as a or condition no of suspended sentence. Excuse, excuse me. me. Uh, was there a protection order or no contact? I believe it was just a no contact order. Okay. I, I, I can state this though. She did, his ex-wife, did file a CPO while this case was pending. We went to the full, and this isn't part of the record, but I can inform the court. We had a contested hearing on the CPO and it was terminated while this case was pending, before he had entered a plea. We had already litigated the CPO. It was dismissed for lack of evidence. Uh, so, but I think to answer your question, Judge, I think there was just a no contact order at that point. Counsel, I was just uh, thinking and hearing everything in regards to the arguments about when it was mailed and when it was stamped, time stamped, et cetera, et cetera. One of my favorite movies, Miracle on 34th Street. And uh, there was the judge taking judicial notice of the United States Post Office and delivery procedures. Um, the judge also here made a comment that um, one of the reasons he didn't believe um, the appellant was because of the fact that 
it wasn't postmarked to the next day, so that means that he put it in later in the day. And um, if you're familiar with the post office, there is a procedure that they will not leave one letter there before they leave for the evening that they do postmark them. So if it's after a certain time, then that's why it gets the next day postmark. So uh, was he was that reasonable for him to rely on that? I don't know where that comes from. I, I, there's there's some assumptions being made. Would you call that an inference or an assumption? I think the court, the trial court, made an assumption. You know, so I guess what the judge is inferring or assuming by his comment is, well, it's postmarked the next day, the 20th. So he's inferring that it must have been mailed between 5 and 8 p.m. What is what if it was dropped at 1.30 and it sits in the box? You know, you go by these drop boxes. I don't know at what point those boxes are empty. Are they empty throughout the day? Are they empty at the end of the day? Were they empty the next morning? Uh, could it be any of those things? So, but the judge made the assumption that because it was postmarked the following day, it had to have been mailed in that 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. window that the state alleges that's when it was mailed. Well, and I haven't reviewed um, the transcript yet or anything, but, you know, I think the judge is making some type of inference that the post office procedures were followed. But what procedures? I mean, what? That everything has to be removed by the end of the day. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't I'm know just, what I'm he's just asking. He made the comment. I don't know what he's relying on or... or but I, I guess I would go back to, it's a state's motion. They have the burden of proof. They presented no evidence that it, would, that, that it was mailed in that 5 to 8 p.m. window. None. And I know this is imposition and not actual trial, but was there any motion made at the end of the state's evidence to say, hey, wait, judge, they haven't proven their case before I even put my client on to have him say what he had to say? Oh, like a Rule 29? Yeah, I mean, I, I know yeah. it's not, it's a, it's a motion in position, right. but it doesn't quite fit, but do you recall that? I, I don't think it's the in case? the transcript that I made a Rule 29 per se, because it, it really wasn't a trial. No, and I, the I just curious if you're right. It, it is not necessarily a form even how to do that at the end of the Right. Case. I know at the end of, this, of my presentation, when the state didn't present any rebuttal. I made the argument. I argued the case, and you know we had a little back and forth about it. But um, but no, no twenty nine. Uh, he would be our standard. Our standard is an abuse of discretion standard. Did the trial court abuse your discretion? Right. How are we supposed to review then the evidentiary decisions and credibility decisions of the trial court? Well, start with the state's case and their burden. They presented no evidence whatsoever that it was mailed between 5 and 8. None. They presented the recipient of the letter, the letter that was postmarked the following day, and nothing else. So what inferences can we draw from that? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a sufficiency weight of the evidence thing, I guess, like we do in a Rule 29 or, a, or an appeal. But I would start with that. What evidence do they have? So well, they have evidence that was mailed the next day, which was clearly after. The, the only evidence we have looking at, I presume, is the postmark that says the next day. Correct. Which creates a question, well, how did you do that when you were in jail? But it was somehow mailed by somebody Correct. the next day. That's the only evidence the state presented, I presume, that, look, here's this evidence, mailed the next day. So it must be in violation of the quarter, which they don't disseminate after right. our hearing on the 19th. I suppose that's, but he was in jail on the 20th. You know, he, that was not disputed. He, he was reported about 10 minutes to 8, actually. Was I think we all agree that he was in jail on the 20th. Correct. Yeah. There's no evidence he, anyone mailed it on his, on his behalf. That's and, what I was going to say. He admitted to me. And he, yeah, he testified under oath. And, and I would also point, his credibility wasn't impeached to my way of seeing it. On cross-examination by the prosecutor, he, he testified under oath. This is when I mailed it. This is how I mailed it. Here's the route I took it. And he explained that, and it was backed up by the Google Maps that we presented. So, um, so you know, in, in reviewing this, was the court's decision unreasonable, arbitrary, unconscionable? Was it without regard to fact? I would submit it was without regard to fact. Uh, and then if we talk about inferences, equal inferences, do you know the rule on equal inferences? I don't need to repeat it. Um, does the decision show a perversity of will? Uh, is, is he 
ignoring facts. I, and I think I would turn to his comments in the record, his comments where he was disturbed by the letter itself. And you need to wrap up. And then I would submit that his other comments about why didn't you mention that to us when you were sentenced by Judge Lockgraves also is a perverse state of will. So I think he was more disturbed by the fact of the letter and made his decision without regard to the evidence presented. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will take the matter under advisement and uh, review it, issue an opinion, and it will be sent to you as well as the state as well as released on the Supreme Court website. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.